Welcome now to Module 3 Analysis, where I'm going to talk with you about the first part of the select phase. So hopefully you've gone through the module material now, and you're here with me where I'm going to talk to you like you're a business partner, where I'm sharing this knowledge with you. I'm going into that extra bit of detail that really I can't get into in the step-by-step -step format of the core material. I'm going to start and chat about the map process. So if you've been following my videos and doing everything, it is step-by-step. -step. You should have products from inside this first part of Select that have gone through the search phase, then gone through the shortlist phase. They've been whittled down. We've applied viability, we've applied logic, and now we're really looking at that sensibility, the competitive nature of what you've found. Because it's not just now about the product that you've found. It's about the actual market that the product sits in. It's really about the size of the market too. We are examining how big is this particular market. Or we are seeing, is it too big for us? Or is it too small for us? What does the competition look like? We're really asking ourselves these questions. Can I compete in this marketplace? That's what I've been teaching you in the videos of this module. First of all, whenever we're looking at the size of the market, we do an Amazon search for that generic term that the consumers are typing in and we see the different results on the Amazon page. We can then determine by looking at the other competitive products that are inside this market, what size the market is. We look at all the BSRs as we go down the page showing all the different competing products. I think the generic terms are probably something to chat about just for a second because generic terms can change as well. If you're in the US versus the UK, it could be the same product, but it could have a slightly different generic term that you need to search for. An example that I can think of with cars is that you have a term for the, for the bumper that some people will call a fender, or you have a trunk that some people will call a boot, and different things like that. Make sure that you've got the correct term depending on whether you're in the US or the UK, because if you're searching for something and you're using the wrong generic term, then you're going to get some misleading data. So the thing to consider when you're searching for products on Amazon is to look at the product titles on the page and start to look at the different keywords that sellers are using. Also try more search terms to see what results come back because sometimes by adding a slightly longer tailed keyword, the search results will change. You'll get a different set of data. There might be a slightly smaller marketplace or maybe a slightly bigger marketplace for a longer keyword and maybe less competition. If the longer keyword is a term that consumers are typing in, then you could actually go into a marketplace with that particular search term. In this module, I was teaching you about determining the size of the market, looking down through the BSRs and trying to gauge how many products are you competing with and what are they selling. You looked at an example that I gave you of a product with results that you don't want to see for one of your products, and that was the water bottle example. When we looked at the water bottle, we saw products that were inside the top 20, top 50, top 100, top 500, all on the first page. So we've got to ask ourselves the question, how could I compete there? If I was to get to that first page, my product would have to be selling a crazy amount of products to actually get visibility. So people in the current Amazon education world are saying, I'm going to have to buy my way in. People are saying things like, I'm going to have to game the system a little bit in order to be able to even compete with these guys. Whereas what I'm teaching you is don't compete. Don't get in there with those guys because that market is relatively difficult. And the amount of effort you would have to expend to actually get in there is so high, you may never actually make a profit. And I don't recommend you give away items. I'm not teaching you to do discounts and things like that. If you do these things to inflate your Amazon sales rank and game the system within Amazon, it's going to cost you a lot of money. When you do the things I don't recommend and don't teach, you're hoping that eventually you will have a high BSR and that you're going to survive off the sales that will be generated from all the work you did at the front. But that's such a big gamble and a lot of those things are against Amazon's terms of service. Giving away items and inflating your sales rank and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's something that Amazon are trying to combat and they're putting things in place to counteract those kinds of tactics. You want to be in profit from day one. There's no point taking six, nine, 12 months of you giving away your profit. That's not a business. That's not taught in any business 101 classes. I'm teaching you just the good old fashioned business 101. I'm teaching you about identifying a marketplace 
where you can see the BSRs and you're saying, okay, this marketplace has a certain number of sales, but there's not too many competitors in this marketplace. We're looking to make sure that the market is not too small because if you found a product and it was the top selling product of its kind, but then the second, third and fourth products are nowhere to be seen in terms of BSRs, they're way down the rankings. Then you can say to yourself, okay, this marketplace is not big enough. The only thing that I could do here is compete with that top guy and take a slice of those sales. Sometimes that might be okay, uh, and sometimes that might not be okay. Whenever you think about it and you see it, if that's all you've got to go on, the market is going to be too small. So we're looking for a sweet spot, but that sweet spot is quite big actually in terms of a decent sized marketplace, but not too big of a marketplace. If the results are coming back with 100,000, 50,000 or more results, then we're gonna to have to do more work to get visible on this particular market. Whereas an ideal scenario is a very low number of results, but they're all great sellers. Our worst case scenario is a huge marketplace with low BSRs, high selling products all over the first page and millions of results. So you wanna go with those numbers that I taught you in the, in the videos in this module, and you wanna really take the map process and you wanna run that every single time you're looking at a product this isn't something you're only gonna do once and never do again. You're gonna become very familiar with this. You will begin to ask questions such as, what can I do different to make my product stand out? How good are the product uh, that you're looking at on the search results pages? You might see a product and the whole way down the page, all your competitors are exactly the same, literally exactly the same. Or on the other side of it, there's too much variation. We saw this with the water bottle. There was too much variation with different capacities, different colors, different features, ones that have infusers, ones that have straws. There were different pack sizes and it was a confusing marketplace for the consumer. We wanna be in a marketplace that's not confusing for the consumer because if it's confusing, then um, you know when we're getting into it, a confusing marketplace, it's gonna be hard for us to stand out. Whenever we see that every single seller is exactly the same, we can ask the question, can we do something different that will make us stand out? Now that's definitely something to think about in terms of the quality of the listing. So please follow the process I teach in this module. Don't deviate. But as time goes on, you can re-watch these videos and you're gonna see new layers of information all the time. I teach you to create bonuses, to do pack sizes if that is available and applicable. And I teach you to create an offer that stands out from everybody else. There are times when you might see there are not that many competitors. So if you don't see very many opportunities to add inappropriate bonuses, there can be times that you can actually just go in and basically compete with pricing. Compete by using FBA because nobody else is using FBA. Maybe the only difference is your product has a slightly different design, which is a difference in itself, but basically it's the same kind of product. For now, I want you to follow the teaching in this module, but as time goes on, you may even see opportunities where you don't see a bonus. The listings are all pretty bad. You know you can go in with really good pricing. You know you can go in with a world-class listing and you know because of that you can compete because there are sales there and there's no one doing it right. You've got a lot of options at your disposal and it's not just the one thing that you've got to compete on. There is pricing, there's pack sizes, there's better quality listings. There's a lot that I'm teaching you to compete with other Amazon sellers. So that brings us on perfectly to the gap, the next part of the process where I teach you ways to improve the offer. I'm not saying that you're looking for a way to improve a product or to create your own or alter a product with a new design. I'm not saying to do that right now. You can do it in time, but doing things like that are quite costly. You need to get into molds if you wanna create a new product and that can add thousands of dollars to your order. And it's definitely not for our first product. It could be something that you do in time once you are more experienced and have some money to invest in creating a new design. I'm not teaching you to do this at the start. If you do, it's gonna be costly. In this module, I taught you to find the gap in the market. The gap's very straightforward because it's, what we're trying to do is we're trying to separate ourselves from the crowd. It's very, very simple in, as a concept and I taught you six things in this module. So I'll start with bonus items. I used a lot of examples inside the videos to give you a really good indication of what you need to do. What we're looking at here is a physical item that is complementary, meaning it complements your product. It's also complementary, meaning it's free to the consumer. 
It's just part of the offer. In terms of what the bonus item should be, don't get lazy with this. Don't make it a simple storage bag or a, or a cloth to clean it with. Sometimes that is appropriate. Sometimes a storage bag is appropriate, but it's not always appropriate. Think of your consumer and think what they are because you know who they are. If you're selling something that's involved in baking or cooking, then you know that they like to bake or like to cook. If you're selling something to do with a garden, then you know they like to garden. You can put yourself in the position of that consumer and you can come up with some really good, simple additional bonuses. I use the example in this module of the barbecue grill cover. If you give that customer a cloth to clean the grill cover, it's not really a, a great bonus. You'd be better off to take it a step further and think, is there some kind of scrubbing tool that wouldn't damage the barbecue that I can give the customer to clean the grill? That would be an example of a good bonus, potentially. It's important that you align your bonus with the end price of your item because you're not going to want to put in a very expensive bonus with a not very expensive product. It should not change the price of your end item. In other words, the price the consumer would pay. If you've been re researching a product at say $19.99, then that product should stay at $19.99. Your bonus shouldn't increase the price. We're not looking to get extra value for ourselves. We want to add extra value for our consumer. We want to flip this around then and we're actually looking critically at our competing and competitors items and we're looking to see, do they have a bonus item? Now we looked at this earlier when we were looking at isolated and non-isolated products in earlier modules. You may already have an answer to that for the main product you started with. But as we're looking at the wider market, we can start to see the other offerings that possibly have a lower BSR and they sell more every day. Do these products have something that the product that I initially found doesn't have? And if so, what is the bonus? We don't want to simply match the bonus of a current seller. If you just match the bonus, you just copy the bonus and you give the same bonus away with your product. So you're not really adding any additional value to that market. If it's the exact same item, then what have you got to compete on? It's back to price again. And then all of a sudden now you've got to lower your price to actually make additional sales because what else have you got to compete on really? If it's the same item and the listings are pretty much as good, you're both using FBA, this would be an example of a race to the bottom when you start doing that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a very easy thing for your competitors to react to. However, if you've taken the time up front to make a better product by adding in the features that people were looking for, if you've added a unique bonus item, if you've improved the listing quality, these are all the things that competitors will be slow to react to. But a change of price, this can be matched by your competitors in five seconds. You want to avoid a race to the bottom with other Amazon sellers on price. If you've got a big competitor in that market, they can undercut you on your price and not allow you to make money because the only way you can get sales is to drop your price. All of a sudden, the competitor drives you out of the market and they then put their price back to normal when you run out of stock, having not made any money. That's what we don't want to do. And I don't want to scare you. Um, I just want to make sure you're aware of that and, and what will happen if you just do something that's lazy. The key here really is to see what bonuses are being offered and what can I do to go a different route. Maybe to pick a bonus that's more appropriate, to pick a bonus that is really more novel. That's really what I'm teaching you to do here, novelty here. It's also important to remember that the bonus should be physically smaller than your primary item because you're gonna to have to pack them together. It's important to think along those lines that my bonus should somehow pack in neatly with my item. So always give that some thought as well. I'll actually return to that in later modules. I'll talk about the folded flat bonuses and that kind of thing. For now, look at the market, start to get a feel, start to take some notes about what's being offered and then you can actually start to brainstorm in your own mind. The bonus item is gonna be about 10% of your cost price of the main product. Now we haven't got to that point yet in later modules but it's not gonna be a very expensive item. It's gonna be something small but it's going to actually help you stand out and all we're looking to do right now is see what your competitors are doing. Now I can move on to talk about the missing product features that you have already found for your products in your Google Sheet. We're not trying to change the item dramatically. We're looking to find those extra features that consumers were talking about in the product reviews. We are looking for things customers wanted to have in the product. That can be something as simple as a hanging hook or an extra pocket at the front of something like that. The example I gave in the module is the better grip handle on the pull rake. 
the pull rake might have a normal handle, but maybe when we started doing our competitor research, people were saying things such as, I like the product, but it just keeps slipping off the handle. I would like to have a little bit of grip around there. That would make the product a lot better for me. Or we might have uh, read customer reviews saying things like, I wish that the net was another 10 centimeters longer. That gives us a feel for what the consumer likes about the product and what they're asking for that could be improved or made slightly different. You can log this in the research notes section of your Google Sheet and you can then see if there's a supplier that can make a net that's longer. There might be a supplier who can make a handle with a different, better grip. These kinds of things are what we're looking for. If we look at say 50 reviews and only one person is asking for a feature, it might not be that important to include. We wanna see the feature mentioned by a few different customers for, for it to be considered an important feature to include. I can't really give you an exact number, you just wanna see the same comment coming up multiple times with different customers. That's because consumers will just say things. They will ask us certain things which are not relevant. And we wanna find a feature that has relevance to a majority of customers who will buy our product. In earlier modules, I taught you about avoiding products that have a knack or are difficult to figure out how to use. After doing more of product research in this module, you might realize there was actually a little bit of a knack to this product. You might have to twist it a certain way or whatever to make the product work properly. In our review mining, we might actually see people talking about this one thing that kept going wrong. It won't necessarily rule the product out, but it's just something you would take a note of. You could make a note saying, when I get my samples later on, if this product actually qualifies, I'm gonna make sure that I check to see this knack of using the product is not complicated. Maybe I've got to include additional instructions to make it very clear on how to do that particular thing. That's some more advanced thinking that I'm teaching you here, but you've got to start thinking this way. I want you to start thinking like somebody who's gonna be a very successful seller on Amazon. This is what successful sellers do. They're people who make an entire business out of just looking where products can be improved and then improving them. It's all about you becoming more critical, becoming critical of the products because you've got so many products to select from as opposed to thinking, I have to do this one product. If you get obsessed with a product because you've done the most work on it, that doesn't mean you should keep researching it. It just means you should be more critical of it. You want the products not to choose you, you wanna choose the products. The only way that you can do that is to have the most amount of research at your disposal. So make choices. If you only bring one product to a certain phase, then that product can choose you and you start to get that one product obsession. So I don't want you to have a scarcity mindset. You don't want to be thinking there's only so many products that are going to work for you because there's so many different opportunities here. And as you become more advanced, you're going to be able to spot them even faster and qualify things even faster as well. I don't want you to skip the review mining. You might think you already know how these products work. You might think, I use this product all the time. You want to follow the system, implement every step, and you'll do a lot better that way. The items I've not been as successful with are the products where I skip this kind of stuff. So don't do that. Poor product performance is the next area I will discuss. It's similar in a way to the missing product features, but it's a little bit different as well. We are looking at how you can improve the product. Whenever you see reviews that talk about something that doesn't work, I'm not talking about the net size of a pull rate because that is a feature. I'm talking about whether the net rips. Was it a problem with the pull rake? You can do the same kind of analysis and research with your supplier to make sure that that problem doesn't happen with your product. When we examine missing product features, we're looking at whether the product should have something added that wasn't already there. When we examine poor product performance, we're looking for things that have been going wrong with this item. It will be obvious from reading the two and one star reviews. You're gonna see that very, very clearly. I also taught about value add. Value add is, a, is really all about pack sizes. Whenever we say that we're adding value in the retail world, both online and offline, it refers to increasing a pack size and increasing the value of the pack to the consumer. The bonus I taught you increases the attractiveness of the offer, but it shouldn't increase the price. On the other hand, the value add can increase the price because you're adding in more value. So this is just another nuance I wanted to teach you in this analysis video. Now batteries are an example of a value add that you often see. 
you might see a five pack of batteries plus two more for free. You might see light bulbs in a six pack plus one for free. Uh, you'll also see it a lot in food items uh, where they'll give you 33% extra and things like that. Whenever we're looking at value add, we're really trying to find out where we can increase the pack size while still being sensible. To be sensible, we can ask the question, is it logical that somebody would want to have more than one of these products? Let's say you've researched vacuum cleaner bags and we could potentially offer more than one of them. You might, for example, see a listing that has got a five pack selling at $19.99. So could you do a six pack at $19.99 plus your bonus item? All of a sudden now, if you were sitting in competition with that original five pack, the consumer is seeing your six pack at the same price and with a bonus. So who are they gonna buy from? The consumer will not say that the six pack size is ridiculous. They're probably gonna say, I'm getting one more of these things that I'm after for the same price. I may as well buy it. I also taught you about the combo cocktail as well. This is having the bonus along with the additional pack size or the more optimized pack size. You just want to make sure that you don't go too far and offer something that doesn't make sense. Now we could also look at product research another way and say, if the five pack was selling for $19.99, could I do a three pack at $9.99 because it's better value. Maybe we're not adding something in, but we're still adding value. So I'll return to this topic later when I talk about optimized pack sizes and sweet spots as well in, in future modules. The main thing I'm teaching you in this whole module is to look at the competitors and see what they are doing. We're looking here for the gap. All these things are about you trying to find a gap for this product that you're researching and we're trying to find out, is there a gap? Is there a gap for you to come into this market? Because if there isn't a gap or the market doesn't fit with us, we're gonna put a line through the product and we move on to the next product in our spreadsheet. We have loads of items, so we don't really need to worry about the scarcity mindset. If the gap's not there, we move on to the next item. Now pricing is a tricky element right now because we don't know the cost price of our item yet. We don't have the dimensions, we don't have the weights, a lot of things we don't have, so we're not currently calculating our profitability. We're not really 100% sure of what the profit will be at a certain price. So what I'm teaching in this module here is we want to identify what the leading price is in this market. Let's say you haven't found much of a gap in terms of what we talked about so far. But you can see that all the items in this competitive market that you're thinking about going into are selling at $29.99. Would a gap be that you could sell that at $19.99 and still be profitable? Of course it would. If that's the gap that we have to find, then we need to move on into cost pricing, which I deal with inside the next module coming up, part two of the select phase. If that's where our gap is, then we've got to make note of that. I've got to say there's very little other gaps here apart from pricing. If that's the only gap that we have, maybe it's not something we want to move on to. We might want to not consider that product. Maybe we want to look at one of the other research products which has more gaps for us. If we've got three or four different competing products that we're bringing through research and one of them we find all six of the gaps as opposed to another one which only has one gap, which one are we going to move to? Of course we're going to be looking more towards the one that has all six gaps. Now the final gap that I taught you is about the cosmetic colour and style of the product. This is where we ask the question, can I come in with a different style and can I get into that market and can I really do something a little different? You might have something that other people don't have and when people see it, they might say to themselves, I like the look of that, that looks great, or whatever the case may be. Here we're focusing more on colour and style than anything else. When we look at a market and we see all the products being sold are the same item, we need to ask the question, can we find something that has the same functionality but cosmetically looks different? We're just looking for something that is functionally exactly the same, but it looks different. What we want to create is a situation where whenever a consumer searches the generic keyword for our listing, they see six competitors who are identical, and then they see us and we are different. All of a sudden, those six other competitors are grouped together as one listing. Not on the screen, but in the, in the consumer's mind. It's in their mind. They're saying, I've only now got two choices instead of seven. We have now increased the probability that that consumer will at least consider what we've got. It's a very, very powerful thing indeed. 
and it can be very simple. Years and years ago, I used to sell some stationery. I had these envelope pockets, these plastic envelope pockets, and the market, all they were doing was selling a certain type of color. And so I did a slightly different color at the time. The slightly different color then just made me stand out and it was more suited towards girls rather than a boyish color. And that actually brought in sales because they were all blues or all reds. There were no pinks. Uh, I'm not saying that you do the cosmetic gap with every single product. We just asked the very important question, can we find a cosmetic gap? We just don't change colors for the sake of it. We're simply looking for something that we can find that will help us compete. That's what this module's all about. When everything looks the same, there's no real differentiating factor between them. What I've been teaching you is to ask the question, can I stand out a little bit? If a product was always black, we wouldn't necessarily say we should do hot pink because we're gonna stand out. We need to also consider whether anybody actually wants to buy the hot pink color. You need to do the review mining exercise and think about who is the customer that's buying this product. Put yourself in the shoes of the customer. As you can see now, we're really starting to create differentiation and an offer that is world-class. World-class offers are not complicated to create. It's simply a matter of looking at these gaps and filling them in with things that make sense and then getting that onto the Amazon marketplace. Whenever you're gonna buy something, start to think along those lines. What would I like to see in that product? It's important to remember that not every product is going to have a gap. There may not be gaps available. And as I said earlier, if there's something you just cannot see any gaps and it looks quite competitive, we just want to move on. Don't say, I'll never come back to that because you may come back to this in the future and have more knowledge. Maybe you see something you didn't see before, whatever the case may be. Really, the point is, this should be quite obvious. Most products don't really have bonuses. Not everybody does pack sizes. Things like that will become quite clear to you. Just be sensible. Think logically and use some common sense at times as well and, and you'll do very, very well with this. Look and see where the gaps are. Note down these gaps in the spreadsheet like I showed you in the module in, in those research notes. And then when you go to speak to a supplier, you have a much better idea in your mind as to what you're actually looking for. I want you to realize that you're actually now in the minority of Amazon sellers. And that's because the vast majority of Amazon sellers are not doing this gap research process. They're taking the easy way out every single time. So you're putting yourself um, in front. You know, By doing all this front-loaded research, you're gonna create a world-class offering. And that's what I want for you because you're gonna have success by doing this. So please complete the building block and I'll see you inside the next module.